Thank you. It's so nice to meet you. Thank you for joining us here on uh, the in the Perry community, as it were. Where mm -hmm. are you in the world? Are you in New Hampshire? Boston. Oh, you're in Boston. Are you from New Hampshire? Nope. No, why? What, who am I thinking was in New Hampshire? Did I misread something? No, no one. No one. No. Okay. In, right. I, no. I mean, right. someone's from New Hampshire. Someone is from New Hampshire. Well, it's, my, my very, very dear close friend is in New Hampshire. And I thought I had read you had maybe grown up there or lived there. Anyway, all, it's all wrong. Um, That's all wrong. It's all, it's all wrong. Liz, I'm just, I'm just going to... Um, introduce you if I may and then we're just going to dive right in um, you might see your screen kind of you know doing what it's doing right now and um, if everyone just wouldn't mind I guess muting their audio um, I believe somebody is manning the call or somebody will at some point but until then if you could just mute and if you have any questions or comments just type them in and I will um, send them this way so welcome to another Perry Talks, Liz Ward, a registered dietitian who has educated people about nutrition for more than 30 years, which I can't believe. Her counseling experience prepared her to translate, I love this, the science of nutrition into practical advice in your career as a writer, consultant, and public speaker. Liz has written many books about nutrition and health and is the co-author of The Menopause Diet Plan, A Natural Guide to Hormones, Health, and Happiness. I need water. <laughs> What's that? Oh, somebody said something about water. Yeah, somebody um, said something. <laughs> uh, and the author of Expect the Best, Your Guide to Healthy Eating Before, During, and After Pregnancy. Liz has also been writing for magazines and online sites for nearly two decades. Your blog, Better is the New Perfect, which is a great title, shares articles on not only healthy eating, but also recipes you've developed and you share an Instagram feed at Menopause Diet Plan with your co-author and fellow dietitian, Hillary Wright, mm -hmm. where you efficiently and effectively dispense information on all things food, nutrition, and menopause, and the intersection of all three. Welcome, welcome, Liz. I'm so glad to meet you and speak with you. You are um, certainly an Instagram favorite as I sort of was pulled into your web there. And I think among other things, clearly your knowledge is, is key, but you do dispense a lot of information around food and wellness and help women, I think, to prioritize what really matters and what they might want to sort of ignore or deeper dive into in terms of the psychology around food and eating and all of that. Does that sound fair? I think it sounds fair, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Liz, just could you share a bit more with us about your background? Um, sure, sure. Yeah, go ahead. So I'm a registered dietitian. I'm also the mother of three, and I live in the Boston area. And, you know, um, a lot of times people will ask me, how did you come to write a book about menopause? And um, I actually wrote it with my best friend, Hillary Wright, who's also a dietitian and has been my best friend since college. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've gone through life together. Um, we both have three children. Um, we both, we live near each other and we've never been able to work together, which is yeah. funny. Um, and so after all this time, this presented itself and we're both um, experts in women's health. Um, Hillary is an expert in PCOS and fertility and um, also a cancer dietitian. And, you know, I'm a pregnancy uh, preconception um, kind of girl and you know we put, just put it all together and kind of um, you know uh, came up with the idea for a menopause book because there's just so uh, little reliable information out there yeah. about yeah. what goes on during perimenopause and after menopause occurs. Did you sort of step into it as you were stepping into it personally? Yes. Yeah and yes. and how was 
it for you? Are you still perimenopausal or? Oh you- no, I'm I'm very much post uh, menopausal, okay. um, mm-hmm. and um, you know I have to say my perimenopause was not um, uh, any anything much to, for me to complain about. I did have hot flashes. I gained ten pounds. Um, probably a lot more irritable than I normally am, <laughs> especially if you ask my family. But the thing that I experienced um, when I was going through perimenopause is my mother was sick and I was caring for her. So I had that perimenopause caregiving thing going on. And I was definitely the filling in the sandwich because yeah. I had kids in high school and I had my elderly mother and I was going through menopause. So I have to say that that probably made things worse um, for me. And I know a lot of women are going through that, but we don't talk about that very much, do we? We don't talk about it. And I think I would love to, if we get a chance, I have so many food questions for you, but sort of circle back to that stress component, because I think that that stress piece is sort of the last piece that's stepping into the conversation in terms of um, how we're doing, you know, how successfully or easily our perimenopause, menopause is looking um, okay. or not. Mm-hmm. So, sorry, I, I, uh, our, our window keeps changing and I wanna try and get your face <laughs> in, in the picture solely. Um, Okay, so so let's get started um, with with uh, with this conversation around food. Although I am curious, Liz, what what's sort of the biggest um, challenge, struggle, hurdle, if you will, um, that you notice and your co-author Hillary, your your, your friend, notices. Um, speaks with women about uh, in terms of perimenopause, menopause, food. What what is what are they struggling with? I'm going to have to say it's weight because mm-hmm. um, you know a lot of times women will gain weight during perimenopause having made no changes in their yeah. eating habits or their exercise habits, and you know it comes out of nowhere. It seems to be very mystifying um, to them. And it's very, very frustrating. I experienced it myself. I Mm -hmm. couldn't imagine what was going on because of course I know all about menopause and I'm going to beat this thing. And it's like, no, Um, it it happens to a lot of, of women. Um, So they, they get down on themselves, um, you know, psychologically. And then the other thing that happens is, you know, uh, because the weight kind of came on fast, maybe, you know, within a few years, they're like, I just want it gone. And, you know, many times they struggle with um, the temptation of fad diets, or they succumb to the temptation of fad diets, and it starts that whole, you know, roller coaster dieting um, syndrome that goes on um, that they may have experienced in their younger years. Um, and then now it's back. It's like, yeah. wow. And it's just so much harder to lose weight when you're older. So, sometimes the efforts become more extreme yeah. and that frankly dangerous, you know, at our age. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I didn't realize how many women in midlife are struggling with eating disorders um, until I started having conversations about food and health and wellness mm-hmm. um, with women in this niche. And it's true. It seems that it's either sort of revisiting itself or it's happening for the first time. And it's so serious and important. And I also think that as much, and I say this uh, uh, more lately than I have in the past, but I do think there, it's important to sort of recognize as you're saying, and this is why I wanted to ask, what is the thing? that women are talking about and concerned about when they come and they work with you. It's important to sort of put the stamp on the fact that weight is an issue only because I think there's this, there's this real sort of back and forth women struggling with, particularly in midlife around, I'm not gonna worry about that stuff anymore. And I'm past that. And that's not, you know, that's not part of my, 
my, uh, my self-talk anymore. And then we find that it actually is. And it may not be around an aesthetic. It may be around health and longevity, but it is happening. We are worried about it. And I I'm, I'm appreciate your answer and yeah. that we are thinking about it. I mean, you know, uh, I'm not saying that it's, um, you know, just because they don't like the way they look, they don't sure. like the way they feel, they can't fit into their clothes. They may have another health problem that this excess weight is exacerbating. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot going on there. Um, there's also that feeling of, well, you know, where's the, my control, you know, yeah. I have no control over this. Um, and, and so, you know, it just all goes together with yeah. all the other changes too. Yeah. So how do you, when a woman works with you and says some of these things, that control piece is really critical. Yeah. How do you start to kind of help her unravel that? Um, so I think by explaining what exactly is going on in the body, and there was recently a study uh, that came out in the journal Menopause about um, how perimenopause may be the time to really focus on um, you know, achieving a healthy weight because the researchers found that once you go through menopause and a little bit you know, after that one day in time when you don't have a period for 12 months, um, it gets harder for your body to use stored fat during exercise. So um, it's not impossible, but it go, you know, it just goes to show that perimenopause is a special time, a time with opportunity um, and a time to understand what's going on with the body. So I explain to them what is happening. Now, the other piece in all of this is age. You know, um, it, even men, gain weight as they get older. So um, it's, you know, it's a general slowing down of the metabolism, but menopause seems to, um, you know, when you are losing estrogen or estrogens like up and down roller coaster, um, it, it, when you gain weight, it gravitates to your belly. So your shape may change as well. Yes. yes. My shape yes. is currently changing. In flux. Yes. <laughs> Same. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's like, wow. Okay. Now that's something. Wow. And so, <laughs> you know, I talk about things that you can change and, you know, you cannot go on these drastic restrictive eating plans. It's just not a good idea. Even though you want the weight gone, it won't last. So I work out with them. What is the most sustainable way of eating that includes the things that you love um, and not in you know huge amounts, obviously. So um, you know, Hillary and I always say that, you know, we abide by like the 80 to 90 percent, 10 percent to 20 percent rule. You know, it's either it depends on the day. So 80, 20, 90, 10, you know, um, 80 percent of the time or 90 percent of the time, you know, you're avoiding maybe some of the things that might you know, impede your weight loss or affect your weight control, um, such as candy and chips and alcohol and um, delicious Cosmos that Hillary and I love, um, <laughs> things like that. And so you decide, you know, you decide, you yeah. decide what pace you're going to take this at, you know, you, uh, what I do is explain that there's all, you know, it's all sorts of decisions that you can make. Mm -hmm. The other thing I explained to them is, you know, again, how, what your body needs in terms of nutrients, you know, at this phase of life in your forties, you start processing carbohydrates with less efficiency. So our plan is lower in carbohydrate, not a low carbohydrate diet, lower than what you probably have been eating and higher in protein. Okay. And so there's a shift there. Why? And I would explain why the shift most women that I've ever counseled do not get enough protein. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they don't even get the minimum, never yeah. mind what some organizations, some groups say women over 50 should get. So, right. so you, you know, you start there, start crafting um, what's right for this person. And then it's, you know, there's going to be give and take and there's going to be uh, trial and error is probably a better way of saying it. And you have to figure out where your balance is. Right. Yeah. Um, 
so you you just you just dropped a lot of information that I want to sort of touch on throughout our conversation, but you brought up first, first, if I could just ask you, this sounds so obvious and silly, but I think that certain terms that we hear over and over and over again kind of lose their um, meaning after a while. And if you could just let us know why fad diets are such a bad uh, play, that would be great. I just want to kind of highlight that because you guys do speak a lot of, about that and really yeah. encourage women to not go down that road. But if you could remind us, that would be great. So a fad diet is anything that's highly restrictive, either um, re, you know, restricts your calories, it's an 800 calorie diet or a thousand calories a day, which you know is less than what a toddler needs, never mind a full grown woman who has lots of nutrient needs. Um, or restricts a food group or, you know, restricts an entire nutrient like the keto plan. Yeah. Um, is very, yeah, is, uh, you know, very, very low in carb carbs are bad. You know, anything that really calls out a food group or a nutrient as being off limits, mm -hmm. um, in, is something that is, you know, what I consider a fad diet. Okay. And you talked about, um, the restriction sort of being detrimental to a woman's health at this juncture in particular. Can you speak to that a bit? Sure. So um, let's say you have a, a plan like the keto plan. I don't mean to keep picking on that, but yeah. um, you know, and it eliminates uh, really, you know, nearly all fruits and vegetables and uh, definitely grains because you could never keep the carbohydrate um, limit you know, to where right. it needs to be, according to the keto people. And, you know, what that does is really drop your fiber intake. I mean, a lot. I'm just taking one nutrient here. Um, and fiber is essential for gut health. So, uh, you know, women um, in their 40s and 50s and after menopause, um, you know, the loss of estrogen means a sl more sluggish gut. Um, more bloating, more constipation. You need that fiber you, for that, for laxation, to prevent constipation, um, to prevent bloating. You also need it to feed the beneficial bacteria in your gut, which drives the rest of your health. Right. So, so, so something like that is very restrictive and very dangerous. The other thing is there's not enough calcium or vitamin D on a... Um, uh, on a um, diet such as keto, um, there there may not be enough protein. Um, it's not a high protein diet. It's a very very high fat diet. Fat diet. Yes. Okay. I'm so glad you said that too because I I think so many of us when we think ketogenic, we're 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 talking about protein and we're not realizing that it's actually a super high fat diet. And then I think the other thing that's so sort of wonky about ketogenic is there's this whole sort of, um, you know, subgroup, I guess, that, that it sort of embraces quote unquote dirty keto. So there's like a lot of bacon and a lot of, um, I, I, you know, uh, like sausage and, and like sort of chemically laden, you know, really high fat uh, stuff. And it's really, it's not good for so many other things, but it's very popular. Exactly. And I, I mean, that's, that's just crazy. Um, if you look at some, and I, there's a guideline in the book about, about processed meats, processed um, meat, yes. yeah, processed meats, right. With all the, the nitrates in them. And of course the sodium and the saturated fat, right. um, you know, the, the cancer of researchers yes. say, stay away from that because yes. that yeah. is linked to colon cancer. Mm -hmm. So now you, here you have a diet that's super high in all those fats and the, the nitrates and very, very low in fiber. You're just setting yourself up for, yeah. for health issues yeah. across the board. Thank you for that, Liz. Okay. Um, one of my questions further down was about sort of understanding how we get a grasp on how much protein and fiber we really do need. Now you did speak in fairly, I think, to, to point this out again, that everybody is different yeah. and their needs may be different for a variety of reasons. But 
Do you, can you give us an idea of what a perimenopausal, postmenopausal pausal protein day might look like, fiber day might look like, carbohydrate day, or is that too, too sticky? Too <laughs> <laughs> I have to do a lot of thinking on my feet here. Oh, no, don't, don't, um, don't think too much. I'm just, thinking, <laughs> I'm just thinking about like, is it, you know, is it protein every meal alongside fiber every meal alongside a carbohydrate? And what does that look like? What might these those questions, be? these questions I can answer. Okay. Definitely. All right. So protein is something that we do focus on a lot in the book for a number of reasons. One is because um, the need for protein goes up after age 50. And it's not that, you know, it, well, you need, let me just backtrack. You need more because the body becomes less efficient at processing it. And you know, what we're aiming to do is preserve what we have, right? So we want to preserve the muscle tissue that we have. And we want to perhaps build muscle tissue, you know, that's good too. And we need uh, a certain amount of protein to do that. So in the US, um, we haven't caught up with the rest of the world and the researchers uh, everywhere else. And we still are recommending you know, 0.8 grams per kilogram of your body weight. Okay. And I can just tell you in the, in Europe, they recommend one to 1 1.2 grams per kilogram of, for protein of, of body weight. So I'll give you an example. So 150 pound woman, I think would need something like with the European standards, 83 grams of protein a day or more. Okay. If they're, if they're really weight training. Okay. So, so there's 83, let's say 83 grams of protein. Let's call it 90. Okay. okay. So, so let's say you have, um, you know, what you should do is be having protein at every single meal because the body likes that mm -hmm. the body is constantly making things that keep you alive all day long. And every single one of them is a protein just about, or is involves a protein in some way. So it needs a constant supply of protein. And what it does is it borrows from, you know, your skeletal muscle, it bor borrows from your organs and it pays it, it pays them back, mm -hmm. but you know, it only pays them back if you keep eating what you should be eating. Okay. okay. This is such a great illustration. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. It's like a bank account, right? Yeah. You know, you can't keep pulling, you know, out, uh, the protein out of, you know, where it's stored and you know, expecting it to still be there when that's your that's your skeletal muscle mass for the most part. Okay. So if you eat on a regular basis, you're just protein feeding that machine. And that's a good thing. So let's start with the let's say 90 grams. So about 25 to 30, maybe 25, 20 to 25 at every meal. And then, you know, a high protein, a couple of high protein snacks during the day. You're going to hit that mark. Okay. But, but, but what do women do? What do most of us do? Eat zero protein at breakfast. Really? Yeah. Oh, at breakfast. Oh, oh interesting. Oh. Okay. Oh. You see yeah. that all the time. Yeah. And I'm telling you, it's not easy to get uh, 25 or 30 grams of protein unless you have like a smoothie that has, you know, all this stuff in it. It's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy. Yeah, it's yeah. doable. It's doable. I manage it, but just barely. It's okay. not my best meal. Um, so you have to really be diligent there because if you don't get enough there, you're behind the eight ball for the rest of the day. Oh, and, so and, yeah. and protein keeps you fuller for longer. So it's going to keep you away from your hand out of the candy dish, you know, mm -hmm. out of the cookie jar. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're grabbing a bunch of pretzels or, you know, you're snacking on chips because you're hungry. Yes. If you have enough protein in your diet, you will not be. Yeah, hungry. it's so true. I can attest to this. If I am consuming protein at every meal yeah. and I have sort of three larger, they aren't large, but larger meals a day and then two yeah. snacks a day and make protein the primary, I... I can go that window of time between meals easily. And right. I also feel much more alert, which is very important. So let me just ask you, Liz, just in terms of sort of getting, hitting the mark without making us neurotic. Do you think that, which I know can be hard, do you think that um, measuring food is, is a good tool or is that sort of veering off into, uh, you know, making us a little too crazy? So, you know, there's, uh, 
the way Hillary and I approach this is a few ways. Um, it, you know, it's like three three things you can do in order to learn more about what you should be eating. You know, you can take all the the tips and all the tricks and all the you know short little bits of information and just tweak what you're already doing right in the book. Or you can like use the plate, our plate visual and just say, you know, half, a quarter of your plate should be protein. Um, half should, that way. Right, right. Yeah. So it's very visual yeah. and you get an idea and you might say, oh, I haven't been getting enough fill in the blank. Um, you know, just looking at this plate now, I can tell that I haven't been getting enough. We actually made one for breakfast too. So it's like a right. separate because breakfast is a little bit odd, you know, right. um, into, like lunch and dinner it's pretty easy, but breakfast is, a, you, know, you have to make a little bit more of an effort. Or you could use a meal plan that yes, does have measurements. Now, um, this would be good for someone who has no clue what three ounces of meat looks like cooked okay. chicken, let's say, um, what a cup, you know, what a cup of cooked quinoa looks like. Um, and so that you can use it as an educational tool. Sure. Um, so that you can figure it out. And sometimes you just have to weigh and measure something once or twice and you know yeah. what, what it is and yeah. you're fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, don't, but don't do that if it's triggering, it triggers yes, something. Yes, else. okay. Yeah. Yes, and that's sort of what I was thinking is how, to, how do you, is it, is, it, is, it, is it worth it? But I, I appreciate what you're saying about it being yeah. triggering. Each can woman has to know what's, yes. what's, what's yes. right for them. Yeah, you're making me think too. Just in listening to speak about protein, I also think right. So many of us who might be concerned about weight, weight gain, weight loss, are worried about the amount of food that we're eating, and we sort of, you know, we tend to go, "Oh, that's that's going to be too much. That's going to be too much." Can you speak about that? That maybe we actually need more than we think we do, if right. that's Right. So if you under eat, if you go on an 800 calorie, thousand calorie diet a day, you know, uh, daily diet, you will actually suppress your metabolism because your body thinks it's starving and it will take every calorie and it will use every calorie to the max. Okay. Right. So if you've been kind of in that cycle, it's hard for you to believe that eating more is actually better. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that when you um, eat a healthy diet, one that's plant-based or plant forward, I should say, there's a lot of volume. So mm -hmm. there's a lot, a lot, fruits and vegetables, right? Are they're voluminous yeah. and um, you feel like you're eating so much, but you're not um, really eating a lot of calories, you're eating a lot of water and a lot of fiber along with the nutrients. So it can feel like you're eating a lot when actually calorie wise, you're not um, you're getting, you know, what you need, but you're also getting all the nutrients that you need to yeah. protect your health. So about calories, could you remind us about calories and nutrient density and why calories may not be sort of the primary concern? Right. So a nutrient dense food is one that offers a lot of nutrients for the least amount of calories. So if you have, let's say, if you're looking to get enough protein, I, always, I keep focusing on protein, but it's yeah. one of the easiest things to talk about. Um, if you're trying to get enough protein and you have a ch the choice between plain, you know, low fat Greek yogurt and ice cream, you know, you would have to eat six times as much ice cream as yogurt to get the same amount of protein. Okay. So yeah. yogurt is a nutrient dense food because it's giving you all of that protein for 132 calories in one cup. Mm. Whereas you're getting three cups of protein in a cup of ice cream, right? It has 250 calories. So, right. so it's really taking a look at the whole package there and all the nutrients that you're getting, get, getting a big bang for your buck. It's like going to the grocery store. How can I get the most for my money with nutrient dense foods? It's how can I get the most for my calories? And let's face it, we all have a calorie budget. All yes. Of us. yes. And, what does that mean? Uh, well, it's really um, the balance point. It's okay. really 
you know, whether you want to maintain your weight, okay. whether you want to lose weight, it's, it's a balance. You've, you know, your body has figured out you do this amount of activity, you eat this amount of food and we stay at this weight. Okay. Um, but that, you know, but that changes as you get older because we naturally lose muscle tissue. Um, it happens to everyone. And that's why strength training and resistance training yeah. is so key um, mm -hmm. during perimenopause and afterwards. Um, and by losing that muscle tissue, it lowers our metabolic rate, you know, maybe just enough to yeah. gain, you know, a pound here and a pound there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you talk to us about soy and sort of where you land on this? Well, I love soy. Oh, I, I love, okay. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. I mean, soy is, is a fabulous category of foods that includes, okay. of course, tofu, tempeh, edamame, miso, you know, all sorts of things. I don't know. Is miso soy? I don't know. I always get that mixed up. But anyway, um, so soy is great. Soy is not a magic food for perimenopausal women or anyone having hot flashes. Okay. Yeah. It is not the magic bullet. Okay. Um, and even the soy people will tell you that. They will tell you <laughs> okay. straight out. We just don't know yet. I have to say that soy foods do work in some women mm. um, to help mitigate their hot flashes. And if it works for you, go for it. Yeah. Because okay. Soy has phytoestrogens mm -hmm. and phytoestrogens are much weaker forms of the estrogen in our body. Um, so you're not going to get, like I said, that magic bullet, um, you know, response, um, right. hot flashes aren't going to immediately go away, but you know, it's a plant-based protein. Um, mm -hmm. it's got a uh, very low in saturated fat, no cholesterol, um, just very versatile, um, wonderful food. So go for it. And it's really good, uh, for your heart as well. Great. Thank you. Um, alcohol and health, this is a hot button topic. And one I think that mm -hmm. I, I certainly experienced this and then sort of began to hear many, many other women talk about sort of losing their, their, their uh, ability to have a drink or two and feel better the next day or get a good. Oh night. yeah. So there's oh, yeah. that piece, and then of course there's the the calories that it adds to your day. But what what? Why do we start having so many issues with alcohol? I don't know. I mean, I mean, it's just like your tolerance just it just goes yeah. Right it down. Really um, it's happened to us. We can't, I mean, we're like, we go out, we have one cocktail and yeah. a huge glass of water at the same time. You know, we're like, we're two fisted, but one of them has water. Right. And it's because this is not going to end well. If there's, you know, two drinks going on here, yeah. um, the next day, it's just not going to, going to happen. And, uh, we joke about it, but I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a real thing. And I don't know, you know, the way that, um, we process alcohol is through an enzyme in the stomach. I don't know, maybe we have less of it as we get older. I, I really have no idea okay. um, why it happens. But I, I do know that it doesn't just dis always discourage everybody from um, drinking women. Excuse me. My dog is having a, a oh, fit. On the floor. My dog. I didn't hear it, but yeah. if you need to Dude. tend to it, go ahead. Don't, don't talk to her because okay, she's. Okay. <laughs> We we want to be your friend. Okay. Um, so, so, but I do know this, that uh, even before the pandemic, women were drinking more than ever. Yes. And I actually wrote a blog about it. Are you drinking more during the pandemic? I, and, I saw that. I saw that. And I also saw an article recently. I can't remember where, but it was remarkable how much alcohol consumption among women increased during the pandemic. It was really quite striking. Men and women. Men um, and I men. think, you know, that really speaks to the stress yeah. of, um, of um, the pandemic itself, you know, yeah. having kids at home that you didn't think were going to be home. I mean, you know, I had, um, oh, quiet, Lucy, quiet. 
<laughs> I had my husband come home and work at home. I had, you know, I, this is where I work. This is yeah. my office, you know, yeah. and my husband came home, my daughter came home from college. So um, I can see where the stress uh, came in um, for, for most women. So um, yeah, the problem is that it's not so much the calories, of course, that is an issue, but it's also the fact that um, uh, drinking is just not good for your health right. and, mo and moderate drinking is, you know, one drink a day, um, one standard drink a day. That's what it's called, which is um, basically uh, five ounces of wine or um, one and a half ounces of, you know, spirits, 80 proof vodka, rum, gin, or 12 ounces of a regular beer, not a craft beer because they have much higher, it has a much higher alcohol content. So, so one or less for women a day. And, you know, the breast cancer experts say, yeah. mm, we yeah. don't know of any level of alcohol that's safe for breast cancer risk. Okay. So I think this all needs to be considered, you know, if you're having a glass of wine every day, that's, you know, in one of those huge. Yeah. Glasses. I mean, I'm thinking five ounces is, is mm -hmm. not many people are adhering to that five ounces. Mm -hmm. That's, that's very, that's much less than people think. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you for that, Liz. All right. Tell us about best and worst foods. <laughs> and I say that, I say that with like a big, like a halo over it. <laughs> well, I think the best food is chocolate. Okay. okay so okay, okay. That, so, we're going down that road. <laughs> No, I, I, I'm, I know, I know what you're saying. I love chocolate too. It is absolutely a best food. I'm thinking in terms of, well, you know what I'm thinking, but I yeah. also don't want to vilify certain foods, but I do. And you, you, you guys are so good at reminding us not to do that, which is really important and so welcome. But I am curious about what should we be prioritizing on our plates and minimizing? Um, you should definitely be prioritizing plants. And I don't mean that you have to be a vegan or even a vegetarian. I think we're right. pretty clear about that in the book. But if you take a look at, you know, the way your plate's supposed to look, three quarters of it, or it could even be a hundred percent of it, um, should be plant foods. So half of it's going to be fruits and vegetables, which we adore for so many reasons. And the quarter of it should be grains, preferably whole grains, but there's nothing wrong with refined grains either. And a quarter of it should be protein. And that could be from a plant source as well, as long as you're getting enough protein from that plant source. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we like seafood, chicken, lean meat, eggs, uh, dairy, low fat dairy, yogurt. Yes. You know, all those foods that you, all the usual suspects, uh, yeah. in a healthy diet, I, I guess I would say. Um, and so, so oh, nuts and seeds as well, sure. And beans, you know, and, and soy, all the things that you might expect me to say. Sure. And in terms of vilifying anything, I mean, I think the what, most evil food, <laughs> If you can call it a food yeah. is probably sugary soda. I think oh, that is yeah. what, yeah, exactly. If I could draw like, you know, like, like one of those ghostbuster signs yes. across anything, it would be that it has no redeeming quality no, as well. Not. Okay. It has water in it and it's hydrating, but for, for us, for this stage of life, no, it's an occasional and, and thing. You would know, you put diet soda in that category as well. No. Okay. No, I would not. No, okay. I would not. It's the sugar. Okay. So, so if I was going to categorize anything as, um, uh, you know, something that you should really limit, but not totally avoid, it would be added sugars and highly refined grains, ultra processed foods, for um, example, um, snack chips, okay. um, Oh, what else is ultra processed? Yeah, you know, um, super refined cereals, you know, okay. like cornflakes, you know. Um, uh, uh, I tend to think of things like in boxes and bags, although that's sort of maybe too general, but things like Oreo cookies. Oh, and, yeah. Oh, yeah. Cookies. You know, sure. <laughs> Yeah. And Poor cookie. how could I forget that? You know, yeah. no, no, no. I, I, I put you on the spot. I didn't mean to do that, but, <laughs> but I was thinking like 
we're super refined carbohydrates and we sort of know in you know we know in theory oh yeah you know cookies and cake and blah blah, blah. but i even feel like some cake is a lot less you know terrible than like Oreo cookies or, you know, it's all relative and, yeah. you know, going down that processed food, you know, road is like, a, a, it's like a black hole because there's so yeah. many different grades of it. You're right. If I made a cake, ho you know, homemade cake, um, with, you know, a lot of, uh, very limited processed food, you know, didn't have any chemicals or preservatives, you know, nothing and no added colors. You know, I just use nice butter, good flour, eggs, things right. like that. Yes. I mean, sure. That is better. It still has sugar, right. but it's better. So, um, you know, pick, pick your treats wisely, I think is, is probably, um, the message here. I, 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 I would never vilify anything except of course the soda, um, mm -hmm. which I do not like, oh, but you need to watch out for added sugars and things like, you know, coffee drinks, um, okay. Starbucks, and, you know, that could be like 500 calories and right. you know, 300 of them could be from sugar and added fat. So you know, you've got to be really careful. Stay away from that. Okay. Um, this is a little bit off the path, but I did see you wrote about creatine once and yeah. I'm super interested about that because yeah. it's also one of these things I think people go, oh, no, 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 you don't want that. Even oh. some people who work out a lot, um, who, and, and, and let me just back up to say that creatine, you'll have to describe it and explain what it is for us. But creatine, I've only heard in um, relationship to gym talk. So yeah. I'm curious what you had to say about it. And if you would, um, what, you know, for, for those of us in midlife, is it beneficial? Is it not? So creatine is an energy source for muscles. Um, and it's not usually used you know, like long for long distance, um, you know, activities, it's really more for strength training and building because it's better, like, in terms of short bursts of energy, rather than um, it, it, the body um, converts it to uh, this whole and it goes into a cycle that gives as the, opposed to like endurance kind of training. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so you know, most of what you have in terms of creatine is in, um, your muscles. So, um, so you can also get creatine from animal foods, which is again, why we don't like to ban any, you know, kind of food from anyone's diet. Um, you can get it from meat, from poultry, from seafood, um, but also from the dietary supplements that you're talking about. And, it seems like it's safe. Um, I don't, I haven't seen anything, um, about it. I, I haven't read any studies about it in, you know, middle, mid, middle-aged women, let's say, and, and it's success, but, um, I, I don't really, um, I, I think it's been, you know, well-researched in other groups, usually young men, which is who they yeah. do the research in, yes. but there's never been really any safety, um, issues. So, so in terms of, you know, maximizing your muscle power and your strength, it's, it's not a bad idea. I mean, again, you don't want to go overboard and creatine monohydrate is the form that's been most studied and is considered uh, most safe. I've never taken it. So I can't say, um, you know, how it, how, yeah, I don't have any experience with okay. it. Yeah, I just okay. know. It was I, yeah. it stood out to me in in yeah. the many articles of yours that I looked through, um, because again, you know, I think anything I so associated creatine with young men working out in a gym, and this was something else. And I just thought, gosh, if there's a supplement or a food source that we can know about um, that is beneficial to our muscles and muscle mass and sort of, um, you know, uh, keeping us, as you said earlier, sort of closer to where we are, yeah. um, then, then it would be something good to know about. It's very interesting. I've actually never thought about it. So um, yeah. I think it's great that you brought it up. Oh, good. I, I, I never thought about it either. So thank <laughs> you for writing about it. Um, breakfast. You talked about breakfast being 
sort of potentially the most difficult meal uh, mm -hmm. to get in enough protein. Um, can you can you get into breakfast a little bit more and sort of what that might look like? And because this is also really popular, sort of in turn, you know, a popular idea of fasted workouts and mm -hmm. what your thoughts are on that. So breakfast is an opportunity. Um, as I said before, if you're not eating breakfast, it's going to be really hard to get everything in that you need during the day. The other reason why we're huge fans of breakfast, both of us eat, Hillary and I eat breakfast every day. We never skip it, um, is because it's, it's better for your body to eat most of your calories earlier in the day. So I'm not saying you have to eat a huge breakfast, but you have to get going on your calories. So, you know, if you, if your bread, let's say your breakfast and your lunch, this is a pretty, um, if you, if you don't eat breakfast, this is going to sound like a huge leap, but sure. if your bre breakfast and your lunch were the like two thirds of your calories or well, more than that, maybe three quarters of your calories and your dinner was only one quarter of your calories, um, you would wake up hungry for breakfast again. Do you see what I mean? So yeah, if yeah. you push them all up to earlier in the, not all the calories, but most of the calories earlier in the day, when your body has a rhythm and it, it, it does much better processing food earlier in the day and not storing it as fat. And then if you ate less at night, stopped eating at dinner, we're big fans of not eating after dinner. Very big fans. If okay. you want to have a substantial stack in the snack in the afternoon, go right ahead, but don't eat after dinner because okay. it's a psychological thing. It's a psychological way of de-stressing that many women are in the pattern of doing. I used to do it myself a lot. And, you know, you just let down with a bag of chips on the couch or right. the Ben and Jerry's on the couch. So if you say, you know, I'm going to eat my dinner, it's going to be satisfying. And I'm going to go brush my teeth or whatever, go do something and go to bed and get the right amount of sleep. You're mm -hmm. going to wake up in the morning. And you're going to say, where's the food? Right. right. So, so that's why we're really big on breakfast. Okay. Okay. And fasted workouts. Any yeah. opinion? Yeah, there's really, okay, I'm the queen of working out on an empty stomach, but I don't do right. it because, okay. because I think it's burning any more fat than I would have. Um, there's really not a lot of research that says that, you know, fasted workouts really change your body composition that much. You know, you're, you, you, know, you may mobilize some fat, but if you, you know, w when you go to eat again, you know, the calories that you're eating or your body's going to repay itself, you know, right. so yeah. it's, it's not a magic bullet. So okay. if you don't like working out on an empty stomach, don't, I okay. mean, as a mother, I learned to work out on a full stomach. Yeah. It was like, <laughs> I guess <laughs> I can run with a bowl of cereal and a banana in my stomach and a huge cup of coffee now because I'm right. a mother. Before it was like, oh, no, 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 we never yeah. do that. So yeah. you do what you have to do when you have to do it to get your exercise in and to feel comfortable. It's all, it's all going to work out. It's all a wash. Okay. Um, this question came up and it's, you've spoken about sugar. Sugar is mm -hmm. a big deal. It's a big deal for me personally. I think for most of us, it is, it's really a challenge. Mm -hmm. What can we do to help us give up this? Also, you know, as I'm talking, I'm just thinking, I hear sort of chatter back and forth between camps that sugar is something you can become addicted to. It's not something you, you're addicted to. Sort of don't look at it that way. Um, I feel like I really have a problem with refined sugar. And if I sort of allow myself a consistent indulgence, it's really, really hard to then, you know, step off the brakes. So that's my personal experience. What say you, how can we, how can we dump sugar once and for all? I say you and I are soul sisters. Because <laughs> I love sugar. I love it. And you would, it, it's obscene how much sugar I put in my coffee in the morning. Um, 
but that's really the only sugar that I eat. I don't eat a lot of candy cookies and things like that. So, you know, I don't think it's necessary to quit sugar cold turkey. Okay. Um, however, if you're in this pattern where, um, like I, I, I can get into with chocolate where I just can't get enough, you know what I mean? You say, yes, I know what oh, you mean. Oh, oh, just have an ounce, you know, and then four ounces later. I know. Oh, I know. I know. I know. Or if there's a cake lying around, I'll just go over and, you know, cut the little slivers off. Sliver <laughs> Until you've had a wedge. Yeah. Just eat a quarter of the cake. I know. I play because that. Because the sugar, <laughs> it's like, oh, it's so good. So, don't trigger yourself. Definitely don't keep these foods in the house if you if you have a hard time. But th- you don't have to quit sugar entirely. Now, mm-hmm. if you want to, you can because mm-hmm. nobody needs added sugar. All right. Mm-hmm. You just don't need it. Um, the, the reason why you get such pleasure from it is because that's a dopamine rush. So mm-hmm. so that's a hormone in so so. You, you eat the sugar, which is often accompanied by fat and your brain lights up yes. the pleasure centers of your brain go. Oh, yes. My pleasure centers love that combination. Yeah, they <laughs> do. Really and it's like, give me more, give me more, give me yes. more, give me more. Um, some people don't, they don't get pleasure from that. They get pleasure from like salty and fatty things that mm-hmm. lights up their pleasure centers. Mm-hmm. So it's all uh, like what you remember um, you know, as tasting good and making you feel good, however, temporarily, because it really is temporary. So I, I, I don't think, I think the verdict is that, you know, sugar isn't necessarily addictive, like a drug is, but it's certainly something that you seek out because it's so delicious and it makes you feel so good. Yeah. And keeping it out of the house is probably, maybe the yeah. best thing you can do. Yeah. yeah I think. Yeah, so. I mean, definitely. If I have a half gallon of ice cream in the refrigerator, no, I mean, all bets are off. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Okay. I, I can control myself around a bag of Doritos yeah. or yeah, I don't care about those, you know? <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. You know, it's the food that you care about that right. you should probably make yourself go get it. If you want an ice cream, Get in the car, go to like the best ice cream stand you can find with homemade ice cream and enjoy your ice cream. Mm-hmm. Boom, it's over. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. We talked about weight loss and your clientele, your, your the women that you work with. <clears throat> and I want to sort of circle back to that again, um, sort of delicately tiptoeing into what I'm about to ask you because um, sort of anti-diet culture is particularly Mm -hmm. loud right now. And I, I think it, it's important and I don't want to, you know, um, get into that, but I am wondering sort of what your top three things would be that we should know and focus on if we do have a goal to lose some weight. Um, well, first of all, Hillary and I struggle with the word diet. We struggled when we were naming our book, mm-hmm. but when we say diet, it just really means a way of eating. Okay, yes. Yeah. You know, Mediterranean diet, you know, yeah. not a diet. It's a way of eating. It's not right. even a diet. Um, so we mean way of eating. However, we also are very firm about the fact that if a woman comes to us and say, says, I want to lose weight. I'm not going to dissuade her if she's overweight, if she's underweight, I'm going to dissuade her or normal weight, I would say, well, why? But, you know, that's a choice that Mm -hmm. women should have. Um, Mm -hmm. And I don't care what your motivation is. If you want to look better or you want to feel better or you have a health problem, I will help you. But in terms of my top three things, it has to be on an eating plan that's balanced and provides the nutrients that, you know, someone in their forties and fifties requires this is, and I also would, another one of my top three things is, you know, say you need to be patient. Um, this weight didn't come on overnight, even though it feels like it did. 
Um, and it's not going away overnight. And we have to figure out that balance between, you know, what physical activity you're going to do, how much even you move around during the day, not exercise, but just moving around and what it is you want to, um, to eat. And, you know, the third thing is, you know, you just cannot do this uh, with a, 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 you know, a very restrictive diet. It must be healthy because um, we have the rest of your life to think right. of now, um, not just how you look. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, <clears throat> any tips for getting back on track if you have sort of fallen off the rails um, with, I don't know, sort of a real sort of commitment to eating well, eating healthfully? Um, I know that happens all the time. I'm sure you talk about it all the time. It does. And, it, you know, we, we don't, we don't consider it falling off the wagon because our idea about all of this is it's, and I do not like this word, but I'm going to use it a journey. A journey, I was going to say, I know I hate using the word, but it's sometimes the perfect word. Way, way overused. But, so overused. Um, if you envision this, um, so first of all, what's your goal? Well, your goal is to be healthier. That's, that should be your goal. If it involves some weight loss. Okay. But if you look at it, like it's a long and winding road, it's going to have dips. It's going to have pitfalls. It's going to have ditches that you fall into. It's okay. You know, you just envision it. Like it's something always in the future. I'm always working towards that. Um, it's the same with anything, you know, you may have spent too much money last month, you know, it wasn't part of your budget, you blew your budget, what do you do, you get right back on. So let's say you have a bad day, oh, not and I don't mean bad, but I mean, one where you ate more than you had planned to, or you wanted to, or you thought you should. And um, the, the first thing to do is to just forget about it. Because dwelling on it does not help. So you get up and you go right back to your routine and gradually that day or that weekend or that vacation, it fades. It's a blip on the screen. It doesn't mean anything. So don't dwell on it, get over it and keep going. It's like, if you fall off your bike, you get yeah. back on the bike and you ride. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Pre-diabetes and insulin resistance. I know we talked about sugar a lot, mm -hmm. um, but there's such red flags for women in midlife. And can you just speak about that as, as much as you know or care to share? So um, there's nothing pre about pre-diabetes. That's what I always like to say. I think that, you know, using the, the prefix pre kind of like, oh, well, it's not as bad as diabetes. It That's is so bad. such a great statement. I love that. It is as bad. It yeah. is as bad. Yeah. And it's kind of, it's sad that we're still using that term. Mm -hmm. Your normal blood glucose level should be under 100 milligrams per deciliter. The level that you uh, need to be at before a diagnosis is made for type two diabetes is 126. Um, wow. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so we've got, 25 points between, you know, 100 and let's say 126. If you're at 125 consistently, that's no different than being at 126. No, it's yeah. So it functions on a continuum and the damage to your heart, to your eyes, to your limbs, to your circulation is greater the, the more you go up that scale. And I don't think that that's accurately conveyed to people. Now oh, I have to put a plug in for Hillary's excellent book, the pre-diabetes diet plan, which she's revising right now. Thank um, you. Yes. And it's very, very good. Very good. And, um, you know, she will tell you that by the time you have reached 126, um, you have lost a lot of pancreatic function. So what does your pancreas do? It excretes the insulin that moves the glucose into your cells so that you don't have an elevated glucose level. But it, it pre-diabetes for years and years and years on end starts to gradually overwork your pancreas. 
and oh. you know, your pancreas doesn't burn out. I shouldn't say that the cells within your pancreas that specifically produce insulin, well, you're overworking them. Right. And, and so if you, you always find out what your, what your fasting blood glucose level is, always find out. And if the doctor goes, oh yeah, that's okay. It's only 120. Like, no. Okay. I, this is yes. so important. Yeah. I just want to yeah. pause you just for a second. Okay. When we go to the doctor, mm -hmm. we should ask if we haven't, I'm guessing many, many, many of us have not inquired about our fasting blood glucose levels. Yes. yes. We should find out what that is. Uh -huh. And if the doctor says, oh, 120 is no big deal, we need to push harder into yeah. the conversation, maybe find them doctor. Any um, thing over a hundred, I mean, you might want to repeat it. If it's 102, you might want to get it done again because it could, you know, there's a margin of error. There's a small margin of error right. in any test. Um, and I don't want, I don't mean to be alarmist, but if it's up in the teens and the twenties, yep, that's a red wow. flag. That is, flag. this is huge. This is a really, really big deal. So many women in midlife hear about certainly hear about this term pre-diabetes insulin resistance mm -hmm. uh for the first time yes and, it, and they're kind of like what what did what just happened where did this come from maybe they don't have a genetic predisposition no. and no. so it feels like it's out of nowhere so age is one of the reasons why they hear about okay. it because anybody over 45 should be getting tested uh with regularity men and women so age is one thing um but also the loss of estrogen has been implicated in some studies as being uh, a, a contributor to, you know, uh, poor blood glucose level control, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, but women also tend to gain weight in their 40s, and that also increases um, your blood glucose level and, you know, causes your pancreas to, uh, you know, have to produce more insulin, send it out into the bloodstream to get that glucose into your cells. Um, so, so there's a lot going on um, all at once. The other thing I wanted to point out is that your experience in pregnancy may affect your risk for um, type 2 diabetes later on. So if you had gestational diabetes, you are at much greater risk uh, for developing type 2 diabetes and um, you should be followed um, you know, as, as uh, someone who's at greater risk. Wow. Thank you for that. That's really important to know. Even so if your pregnancy was at 23 years old, doesn't yeah. matter. You That's were at great risk. Wow. That thank not you. Matter. Nope. Oh, I'm so glad we asked that and talked to you about that. Cause it's a big, big piece. And I don't think it's discussed at all it, it, as much as it should be. And I have to tell you like about, I think the current stats are 89 million Americans have prediabetes uh, versus, um, I don't know, much less diagnosed type two diabetes. Most of the diabetes that people have is type two. Um, and if all those people convert over to type two diabetes, wow, it's a big problem. So what we wanna do is um, curb that risk right now in perimenopause um, and whenever, or whenever you get that. And what does that risk. look like, Liz, to curb that risk right now? Okay. So um, it may involve weight loss um, and you're just losing uh, something like seven to 10% of your body weight, which is really not a lot. It has been shown to be incredibly helpful in reducing um, your risk for type two diabetes, like phenomenally helpful. Plus you have to, you need to lose seven to 10%, but you also have to exercise. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. So, so, but not excessively, it's just really within the realm of the guidelines for everybody else. So it's 30 minutes of aerobic exercise, something that's pumping your heart up, like brisk walking or cycling or jogging, um, at least five days a week, it should be at least 30 minutes a day for five times a week. And then two times, two non-consecutive days of, uh, strength training. And that's, wow, that's the recommendation. Yeah. 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 And, you know, and that in a, in a very well regarded study showed 
you know, risk reduction, significant risk reduction. That's incredible. I'm yeah. so glad to hear that information. Thank you so much for sharing that. Is there anything else that I missed, Liz, that you feel like you really want to sort of leave us with um, something that is particularly important to you around this? Um, yeah. One of the things that's really kind of rather new is um, about hot flashes. And hot flashes are really more than an annoyance and, uh, and, you know, like a sleep wrecker and you complete, you know, just, ugh, just so, so bad if you have them, you know, frequently, um, they are actually linked to a higher risk for heart disease. And it, it's actually being considered now that, you know, hot flashes are a, you know, a risk factor in and of themselves, in and of themselves for women. So, um, Heart disease is something we don't really talk about, you know, enough uh, with women and heart disease is the number one killer of women in the yeah. United States. So if you have frequent, um, you know, uh, uh, hot flashes or sustained for years, just goes on and on and on for years, um, you really need to speak with your doctor uh, about getting that taken seriously, getting your blood lipids monitored, um, because heart disease kind of presents differently in women yes. than it does in men. Um, and, you know, just being up on that and saying, you know, those hot flashes, they really are more than just a pain in my butt. You know, they really are, they really could mean something for me health wise. And would you say, Liz, that? Focusing on food and proper nutrition and movement and stress mitigation. Maybe this is unfair, but no. would it, would, d does that impact the sort of severity, intensity, frequency of hot flashes that you've seen? It can. Um, okay. So, and different things work for different women. So limiting caffeine may work for one woman and not work at all for another. Limiting alcohol or getting completely off of alcohol works for some women, doesn't work for other women. Um, by the way, drinking uh, disturbs your sleep. Yeah. So if you have hot flashes, like it, it, this, you, can get the, like you can get into this cycle so easily where you've got hot flashes, you can't sleep, you get stressed out during the day, you have a glass of wine, you go to bed, you never really get a deep sleep because is it the hot flashes? Is it the alcohol? And sure. you just get into the cycle. Um, and, and it's really hard to bust out of it. So, uh, it could be alcohol, could be caffeine. Um, it could be, uh, being overweight. Um, women who are overweight tend to have more hot flashes. Um, so it, but it's not any, you know, it's not like here's uh, here's a plan for you to lower your blood cholesterol levels. Like sure. there's no singular that it pretty much works for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. There's no singular plan when it comes to hot flashes. Okay, I'm so glad you brought that up. I'm I'm really grateful for that. That's critical stuff, and I think we tend to, particularly around hot flashes, it's sort of like the you know the comedy in the room in a lot of ways like we all you know we, there's this sort of like collective agreement that hot flashes is the main symptom and haha ha, you know oh I feel this I feel that but this is really serious actually and bringing the science back to this piece is is critical I'm so glad you did thank you if it's not serious from a physical sense it's definitely serious from a psychological sense yeah. I don't see any humor in hot flashes yeah 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 um what's next for you <laughs> <laughs> what is happening? I don't know every day is different around yeah. here I have yeah. no idea there's always yeah. this project and that project um yeah um, I just started blogging for WebMD, so that's keeping me busy about heart health, by the way. Um, yeah. Okay, WebMD, I have to check that out. Thank you. And as I said, Hillary is busy um, revising her um, diabetes diet plan book. Um, and she also is the author of the PCOS diet plan. Yes, thank you well. for mentioning that earlier. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I mean, it, we'll it just, just keep listening and all the time. Yeah. 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 Um, 
Liz, I can't thank you enough. This has just been a fantastic, informative, helpful, fun uh, hour. And I'm really, really appreciative. Thank you for coming and speaking with us and educating us on many, many important things. And I would love to um, ask you to come back. I, I, I would love to speak with Hillary if you both want to do it together or I, sir, I really want to speak to her about her uh, book that she's yes, you, work you, with. you should. She is my diabetes queen that I bow down to. Fantastic. Um, she knows all things diabetes. Well, um, she, yeah, she also has two two brothers with diabetes as well. So she's really lived it. Yeah, um, yeah she's had a lifetime of it. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, we'll we'll definitely re reach out to her, but I would love to speak with you both maybe together. That would be fun. And um, <laughs> thank you so much. It was a pleasure to meet you and speak with you. Pleasure to meet you too. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you guys for joining. And uh, we'll talk soon. Okay. I think. I